Hello everybody. This is our, our next webinar about object-oriented programming. Let's check the sound, check the video. Uh, can you can you see me? Can you confirm that you can see my face and you can see my screen and you can hear me well? Because this is uh, new equipment, new setup. So I need some confirmation from you that you are that we're good to go. So say something in the chat to make sure we are being recorded well and we can start. Can you confirm? Because I remember last time it was it was yeah there was some delay in the chat. All right, so actually that's a very strange situation on YouTube. When we record this um, the webinar, uh, sound could be louder. So let me check the, let me try to make it a bit louder. Yeah, how about this? I have this new microphone, which is supposed to, supposed to catch my sound well, but maybe. Because when I make it louder, then uh, there could be, the sound could go a little bit wrong but anyway I hope you can hear me well so our story today yeah I, I was saying that on YouTube when you record the whole webinar in this live mode then they for some reason they lose the first few minutes so that's why we talk about some you know this configuration stuff and then we start so I don't know I never know how much they're gonna cut off from the beginning of the recording so let's hope everything will be recorded from where we are now and I will try to show you today actually I'm not in a big expert of, in what I'm gonna show you today I am basically a user of this technology and I didn't invent this technology but I am using it in, in a number of projects I was using it before I'm using it right now so I'll show you how uh, in Java you can we can design a language a, a custom language a domain specific language as they are called DSL uh, which is which can be used for custom situations First, I'm going to show you a very simple example in just maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then I go, I will jump into the real practical example, the live example of the EOLang, which I also, the compiler, I also designed, we designed, there were a group of people working on that. We designed using the same technology, which is called Antler. Um, so I'm just right there at the example place. So let's say we want, what is the main specific language? It's some language which you, so you basically design an interpreter. So you need a piece of software which will uh, take as an input some text and then going to parse this text and then take important elements out of this text and then transfer those elements somewhere else. So we basically need to design a software which will interpret the text which is in front of us. And in order to do that, we... So basically, let's say in our example, I called it letter. So we're going to translate the letter which is written to somebody. Let's say we want this format to be understood. So let's say we write, hello, Jeff, and we want the software which will listen to this text and it will say, oh, we are talking to Jeff. So that's basically a parser. But instead of using like a traditional way, regular expressions, for example, which is, you know, very simple, traditional way, or maybe even, even easier, you can, for example, split this spring into two parts and say, okay, let's split it with the space inside. And then we take the first part, we ignore it, and then we take the second one, and that's the name. But um, a regular expression is a more comp com complex, more sophisticated way when we design a regular expression and then we put like hello and then the comma and then maybe a number of spaces and then the Jeff will be there. So it will be like a quite long, no, in this case, not very long, but a regular expression. But the next step, the next level, level number three, is when we design a custom language. We design a custom uh, parser and then a custom grammar analyzer and which will be able to which will allow us to do whatever we want actually anything with this text uh, and parse it any possible way so how does it work we have this software which is called antler antler like this it's very very old and very mature and stable package for java which basically does Two, it, it, it makes this pr process in two steps. I highly recommend you to read the book about this. But in a few words, there are two basically in all, all software which do this, they all 
do it in the same way they just uh, there is a first step which is called parsing and the second one uh, uh, is called uh, um, you see I'm not really an expert so the first one is lexer the second one is parser yeah first one and the first step you break it down lexer yeah that's the word lexer and then parser so two two steps and that's uh, when we do the lexing the lexer actually breaks down the whole text probably using regular expressions into into lexems so-called and in this file which we called g4 that's by convention you call it g4 you basically design your grammar you design how your language is supposed to 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 work and uh usually again by convention at the bottom you did you define lexems so these lexems are usually in, in high in in um, in, um, uh, in all capital and you say for example hello the word hello is we call it hello the word hey we call it hey if you find comma then it's going to be comma for us if you find a name so this is a regular expression if you find something which looks like this then it's going to be a name if you find space or more spaces then it's going to be just one space for us so we basically here we like tell this uh lexer we explain to the lexer how to convert how to break it down our input into lexems so now it's not going to be any more uh it's not going to be hello uh, sorry hello jeff it's going to be uh, hello comma space uh, name so lexer will do exactly this it will take this text and using the internal mechanism will convert it into into these uh, lexems and then the second step we instruct the parser how to put all of these lexems into together and we uh, create structures which are uh, which are mm, aggregation of lexems so let's say for example the structure is called intro intro could be hello or hey that's a you know you can write it like this that's the syntax of this antler so you say intro is either hello you can use brackets here either hello or hey so basically we are telling that hello here will be converted into after this instruction from the leg for, for the parser we are saying that uh hello is actually intro comma space name so the, the the lexer will understand okay we can even say like this let's say hello hey and then comma like this and then we can say comma there or comma not there it's still going to be intro so in this case the converse the, the translation the parsing will will convert it like this so hello comma space name equals to intro space name oh yeah intro space name we can even say space here let's say space is mandatory okay so that's that's the job of the parser so this is what was done by the lexer and this is done by the parser i hope it uh, makes sense so far so let's go let's go to i'm just checking the quality of the video all right that's the step of the parser and we tell this parser what to do then we create the letter so it's more a high level construct high level entity for the parser so we'd say the entire letter for us is intro and then should go the name and then should be that's it intro name and sometimes they say even end of end of file sorry end of file there so end of file is kind of predefined the default the default uh, lexem which exists right there so you see if i say something like aaa it says red because it doesn't exist there but end of file it's like predefined predefined uh, thing inside that that antler so this is the syntax that's how we designed our domain specific language that's it that's all we need to do we can delete this and this is our language but by convention they do it uh they usually do it like this so they say uh empty lines and even the, the the semicolon goes to the next line i don't know why but that's that's usually how they do it that's your grammar and then the next step is actually to compile this stuff and to turn it into java 
in order to do that, we have uh, the plugin for Maven. You can see how it works. You can learn how it works. It's very simple. You just put the plugin and the plugin will take your file. Uh, I'll show you where it's located. So if it's the project, then it's source, main, antler, and then the location here. So basically next to your Java directory, you put the directory called antler4, and then you configure the Maven plugin and the Maven plugin will pick it up. And that's gonna be the package. So you, you put it into the right package and say here you say grammar letter and the same name of the file. And after you do the, uh, you compile it, maven compile, so follow me, I say maven compile, and now this compiler, antler compiler, will take these files and will create extra files, extra Java files, so it's going to be generated Java files, and they're going to stay in the target, generated sources, antler, org, example, and then there you go. So a number of Java files were generated, letter, listener letter lexer letter listener letter parser there are pretty big files so these files are actually the java code which will do the work and they are they're they're big and we're not gonna we're not gonna understand what they do i don't think we're supposed to but they actually you see i think they use regular expression or not i don't know what's going on inside they basically the code which we would write if we would uh if we would uh, do the parsing ourselves, but they did it for us. So if you go back to the packages, then you see that uh, these files appear here. And now we can put our Java code on top of that. This is how it looks. Look, this is my Java code, which I wrote. Uh, it's just a simple class, which I called ladder, uh, which uh, encapsulates just a string, just the input basically the, the text which we're going to parse. And then it's going to be a very simple one method parser, parse, which will first create the lexer. This is the generated class. So this class was generated by Maven plugin. So I didn't have it, I didn't write it, but it exists in my project right now, it's here. Lexer, yeah, letter lexer. And then I provide the input using this text. And then I create letter parser. Remember two steps, the lexer and then the parser. For the parser as an input, we provide the lexer. So in order for parser to understand all of these combinations and, this, and the aggregation of these lexems, we need to provide a stream of lexems from the lexer. That's it. And then we say parse dot ladder. So here dot ladder is the method which was also generated because we called it here, because the high level entity here is called ladder. So ladder is converted, is turned into a method by this antler compiler. And then I say dot letter, then I say dot name. So this dot name is from here. You see this name here. So that's again auto-generated code. And then I get it get text. So get text will so I say I say here, hey parser, do the parsing, return me the letter, and then give me the name which you found there, and then give me the text of this of this name. So that's basically it. And now let's try to run it. In order to run it, we make a unit test, obviously. So that's a simple unit test. We create this new letter with the same, you know, that's my class letter. I provide the input. Hello, oops, sorry. Hello, Jeff. Then I do letter.parse, and then I compare it with this name, compare with that it equals to Jeff. If we run it, then it should work. Yeah, it does. So if I say, instead of Jeff, I say, uh, I don't know, John, then it should fail. Yeah, it does fail. So basically our parsing works. It does all the stuff, all the stuff, it, 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 it reads, understands, and so on and so forth. Uh, if I say something wrong here, for example, I say, blah, 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 instead of hello, Jeff, then I run it and we are supposed to get an exception or something like that. Yeah, you see that's a full list of some stuff, token recognition, error, error, he doesn't like it. And instead of John, it returns missing name. So it's it's total total garbage in there. Actually, in order to prevent the, um, the, the standard output or standard error stream being uh, spammed by these um, error messages, we need to inject the special error listener. They call it error listener which we need to inject into the lexer and then into the parser. And then I will show you how it works in, in a few minutes. 
and then the exception will be thrown right here because now look it 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 does all the job it turns it it parses it understands the text and then it says something is wrong missing but still there's no exception so it continues it tries to it is not fail fast it's complete different strategy so it tries to understand the text till the very end and uh, it doesn't fail anywhere so this method doesn't fail it returns something but instead of returning anything it <clears throat> the text is their uh, missing name some weird stuff but that's how it, that's how it works um uh, let me show you one more thing and then we go to real practical example more interesting stuff so uh what's interesting is that sometimes we need to uh we, we may need some help in uh understanding uh, whether our grammar actually works by example and we don't sometimes it's difficult to do it through unit testing when you design this stuff like this then when it's short it's it's easy to understand what's where but if it's longer then you may need some debugging and for this i'm using this stuff so in in intellij you can click here and say test rule letter and then you have the input uh the input uh input window where you can say hello jeff and on the right side it shows you the tree the the abstract syntax tree which is called ast where it put it puts all the uh things from the from the grammar look at this letter maybe it's too small for you but uh let me try to make it yeah there you go so now you can see it uh, so so this is the letter and then it goes the intro you see here the intro and then name jeff and then the end of file and then intro is broken down into hello comma and space if i remove comma for example look it just gets out of here and space is still there look if i say more spaces you see the spaces they grow here because the actual content of the space is here but because we said space we put this plus plus sign in there so it means that all spaces they, they go one after another they will be uh, as one if i say it like this then the grammar is not going to work anymore you see there's some error so i need to say it with the with this syntax it does work and name is jeff i can say jeffrey and then the name becomes jeffrey or i can say jeffrey uh smith you see now the space and the smith they just go away but i can say for example like this and now the the smith so you get the idea so i interactively can change my grammar and see how it's being parsed by the by this antler uh, parser and lexer that's pretty much it that's the whole theory i highly recommend you to read the book about this uh, this library which was created actually by one guy that's to my knowledge uh, he was the author i don't remember his name but he was the author let me look it up actually he's very very i think talented programmer and very famous for for this specific library uh yeah terence parr that's right terence parr uh is the author and he wrote the book about this which i which i read many years ago and i still remember the concept i don't know the details of this library it's very complicated inside very complex but uh the principles are very basic and, and simple and this library is not actually they, they didn't he didn't invent the idea this idea they it existed long before in c language in c plus plus language long before this java library but uh, for the java world this is the library so now <clears throat> the next question is how we make it more interesting by actually instead of just parsing this stuff but actually uh converting it to something more meaningful meaningful because in this situation in this latter case we just parse and then we take just the name of who the letter was wrote written for but how do we take more information from this let's say it's a long long text with for example a language like a programming language let's say you parse uh, a new programming language then there will be many many elements inside and we need to convert them to something else so how do we do this a very uh, impractical but very practical actually but very inconvenient way is to inject java code right here uh, 
So it is possible to put Java code right in this line, for example. So we can say, uh, we, can, we can put actually Java code in any place in this, in this text. So Java is perfectly integrated into this, uh, into this document. So let's say, look, la la. We must see, oh no, we're not going to see boom here because intro was never found. But if we get back to the normal syntax, and let's say hello Jeff and Jeff here. So I run it and we're going to suppose to see boom on the screen. Uh, we don't. Oh, that's sad. Uh, let's say, I'm um, out this. No, still no. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it must work. Okay, I don't know why it doesn't work. Uh, oh, wait a second. Of course, we need to recom. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good point. We need to. Uh, we need to. Uh, to recompile the whole thing so that's that's silly me so when i put something in here it doesn't mean that my files this lexer this letter parser and letter lexer they change automatically they don't so they stay the same so when i put some code in here then i need to every time to recompile the auto generated java file so i go to again and i say maven compile I don't know, maybe it's possible to configure IntelliJ to compile it automatically, but I don't know how to do it. If you know, then tell me about this. So now we recompile it and then I run it and then we supposed to see boom on the screen. Yeah, there you go. So now boom is here. So we can put any Java code in here and more on top of that, we can um, say that uh, we can configure, uh, we, we can make by default every thing here every um, element here in this language uh, they return some internal structures from from inside and this internal structure they're like entities of this uh, of their uh, java domain but we can change that and say i don't remember something like returns uh let's say string now i'm, I'm not i'm not sure i remember uh how it should be so you can say returns uh Maybe, I don't know, list. No, I'm not sure exactly how it works. I don't remember. So anyway, you can say you can in inject Java in here and, and configure it the way that uh, when parsing uh, is happening, then the, the ant these antler libraries, they will generate the necessary Java structures and so on and so forth. I was doing it for many years, actually. I, I forgot the syntax, the exact syntax, but I was doing it this way for many years. And then I was just a few months ago, I got a suggestion from, from Stack Overflow, actually. I posted a question on Stack Overflow about this. And uh, they told me, many people suggested there that I shouldn't do this. So I should not inject Java in this, in this uh, grammar anymore. That's a bad idea. So I should keep this grammar clean and then when everything is compiled, then after, no, not everything compiled, when parsing is happening, then there is a thing which is called listener. Look, this is the letter listener, the, the interface which is generated by Antler, which I can extend this interface and then inject the listener into the, into the parser. So here, look, this is, this is how it should work. So I have this parser and I say parser uh, add parse listener. And the parse listener is the class which I uh, which I create myself. Let's say uh, my listener. So that's the right way. Final class my listener, and uh, and then I say it implements letter listener. And then I implement many, many methods here. I'll show you right now how they can be implemented. And I can now inject this listener, my listener here. So now when the parsing will happen step by step, at certain point of time, I'll show you when right now, my listener will be, will be called. 
and then I can do something with this with this data. Let's, for example, here, let's look, take a look at this. For example, I say enter letter. So this method enter letter and exit letter, they will be called enter letter will be called when the parser finds letter and then exit will be called when the parser says, OK, letter is finished. We're right here. So at this point of time, the letter enter letter will be called. And then here will be, let me show you, uh, sorry, exit letter will be called and here will be enter letter and I am able to put my code in here through the listener let's for example do it like this here let's do nothing intro and then there are visit terminal and that's like system methods which you also can override you see entry enter every rule enter every rule something like that but if we do it like this already then we do enter letter exit letter then enter intro exit intro okay we want to see everything so let's try good and now we can run our test again. There you go. Let's look at the output. You see, enter letter, enter intro, exit intro, boom, because we didn't recompile the grammar, and then exit letter. So when the parser goes forward, while the parser goes forward, I can see what's happening in the parser and this is the moment of time according to the experts of this uh, antler thing this is where we're supposed to build the data or whatever we want to build while parsing is happening that's what they recommend to do and i did it and i did it now i'll show you how i created eolang compiler parser to have you to show you more practical examples so enough with this code i'm gonna switch to another screen right now uh let me switch it here oh, it's not so easy yeah so now you have to see another project which is eolang uh, and now i'll show you the real stuff this is program it's much bigger than what you see which what you saw before uh, that's a real grammar the program it's quite long for eolang it's not huge because the language is quite simple but still, you see there are many more lexems. And then there's a, some even Java code, which is inevitable here in order to make the tab tabulation uh, possible and so on and so forth. When you have time, you can research that. It actually works already. Um, then I created this class, which called syntax. That's what I call it, syntax, which is doing this work, uh, which is similar to what we saw before. Look, this is Lexer. I don't know why I did it this way. Yeah, the lexer. My name in my case it's program lexer, not letter lexer, let, like we had before. It's program lexer, and then we have this uh, parser, the same story as before. Uh, here I injected, like I promised you, I injected. Look, into the lexer I injected uh, error listener, and into the parser I also injected error listener. You see, it's the same stuff. Errors, errors, errors is actually the instance of uh, this base error listener which when syntax error happens, then I basically threw an exception. I don't ignore it. I don't let uh, let the parsing continue or lexing. Lexing is the right word. Uh, so I just stop. I just throw an exception. So, but the same, the process is the same. Lexer, parser, and then, then it's an interesting part. I created the listener. Again, like, we, like I did before, listener. So the listener is... Uh, the listener is used here through this parse tree walker. I don't remember why I was using this walker here. Maybe it's necessary this way. But the idea is that I have the listener. And when I parse the program, I uh, use the listener, which accepts all the elements of the language when they, uh, when they happen. And in the listener, I'm interested in general. My, my objective was to... Actually, it was not the objective in the beginning, so I was not planning it to do it this way. But this design kind of 
forced me to do it this way. I decided to translate the Eolang syntax to XML. It seems to be more convenient for me, more than any other approaches. So when look at this listener, so the listener now has many, many methods coming from the interface. Look, enter program, exit program, enter license and exit license, enter methods, whatever, enter exit, enter exit, many of them. So it's very kind of data oriented and very procedural imperative way of dealing with, uh, with the situation. This is their design by that's how this antler is designed. So I had no choice but to accept this data in a very incremental and uh, deterministic way. Like the data is coming, I accept it. And I need to put them somewhere. So basically my choice was, the first option was to create some uh, data structures in Java using, I don't know, hash map, using lists, using maybe simple dummy objects, date, date, DTO, I don't know, something. Or I just put this data when they arrive into XML documents. Yeah, I think my, my video is uh, is off already, uh, but uh, you can still hear me. That's that's more important. Uh, oh, hold on. I don't know. Maybe it's the camera is off. Yeah, the camera turns off every half an hour. Um, so what I was saying is that uh, I had no choice basically. I had to uh, I had to somehow deal with the incoming data. The data is coming and I need to put them somewhere. So I decided to put it into XML document. And you know this library assembly, which I uh, actually told you about in maybe, I don't know, 10 webinars before, a few years ago. It's a very simple, uh, very simple uh, instrument in order to create XML documents. Uh, it works in, it's, it's a, actually imperative language. It's a collection of directives. I call them directives. So here, look, this is, uh, I create the collection of directives. This is coming from the library called Xamly, which you may want to uh, research yourself, Xamly. Uh, this is the collection of imperative instructions for building XML document. For example, look, this is the first line, enter program. So this happens first. When the program starts, look at the syntax here. Uh, that's the program. It's the first line here. So it's the first entity of the of the grammar. And when this when we find out that the program begins, then this method is called enter program. And when when the method is called, then I'm doing this. I say this directives directives add element program. So after this, the the document looks like this. The XML. So if I convert this collection of directives collection of instructions into XML already, then this XML will look like this. After this instruction, attribute name equals to name, it's gonna be this. And then some name here. After this instruction, that's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be name. And then here it's gonna be version. And again, the value will be injected and so on and so forth. So we um, incrementally, step by step, generate the XML document. And then exit program, look, we add some other attribute and then we move up and so on and so forth. When the li license shows up, we again add more instructions to the XML building set of instructions and we move on and again and again. So every time something happens with the grammar, if you look at the grammar, you can see like many things here which can happen, then if every time something they see, the label is there, okay, we do something. The tail is there, we do something else. So every time we go through this syntax of Eolang and we meet the different elements of the language, then we drop something into XML. And in the end, if you look at the test, look here, syntax text. So this is the test which uh, uh, compiles the, takes the, takes the file Fibonacci. Let me open the file. There you go. Yeah, this is the, the this is the syntax of the language. That's Eolang, the language which calculates. It's not actually right. It should be like this. Yeah, that's the correct syntax. That's the correct way. I mean, the right way to. That's our Fibonacci uh, calculator. Uh, sorry, like this. Uh, and now we want to compile it. 
and when we compile it let's go to the test here we run it and it should work let me first check that it does some compiling parsing actually it doesn't compile anything it just parses it takes the eolang syntax and turns it into xml so here's the xml you see it's, it, it just drops the xml into the into the log in the output so this is the xml it generated it starts like i promised you program then the name is here the version is here and then look listing it injected the full text in here just for the for the sake of uh, recording and then the metas meta line four meta and so on and so forth and so on and so forth and then the objects all the objects found there everything we just saw in eolang is converted to xml and it's pretty simple it's much simpler this approach than if i would use data structures in java because look at the amount of code i have here this is my listener even though it's big but it's not huge it's like 300 lines of code including everything so just not so many basic operations with the xml so we built xml file here all the methods are quite simple they just you know it's, it's easy to understand every time you see something in the in the syntax you generate xml file i think this is the right way in general i think it's applicable not only for eolang it's applicable to many other cases you read the input the input is complex it has it has its own structure logical structure what goes in what goes out i mean how these uh, elements of the uh, of your language they they interconnect to each other you don't copy this structure into java which many people i think do and i i don't think it's right so you don't create the same structure in java objects i didn't do that i instead created an xml structure and then i'm using different instruments for xml manipulations i'm using xsl actually and then i'm using xsl manipulations many of them in order to to work with this structure on the xml level and if you look at the amount of code we have here it's much smaller and they, it's much cleaner than if i would do it in java let's for example take a look so i um, uh, i generate the, the xml and then let's say i want to make sure that uh, that uh, that there are no no errors in the in the language so i created a number of xsl files look at them it's a collection of xsl checkers so each xsl here in the directory errors is going through the xml structure and tries to find there certain violations of the syntax so let's say i want i don't want to have duplicate aliases oh no let me give you a a, a better a better example uh, uh, yeah okay let's let's use duplicate aliases so i uh, i don't want in the language to have uh here you see we have the alias so it's possible to say here alias uh for example foo abc and then i don't want to enable this so if somebody has foo and foo here then i want to raise an exception so i want to say it's an error for the language you're not supposed to do that how i would do this my first step is that i parse the the eolang the parse the syntax and then i generate xml file it's all good if you run it right now look let's do it let's build it with this syntax and see what we generate yeah look at this xml file we have meta meta line uh, look what well, this is the code we're looking for meta at line six says alias full abc and then let meta at line seven says alias full xxx so that's all i have that's my xml and no errors so far but then i want to catch this this uh, problematic situation catch it and raise an exception how do i do this i create this xsl file which i apply on top of xml and this xsl is doing the job so first of all it uh, it breaks down this every element into two parts like with the with the space inside so here uh, it breaks this tail into two elements but anyway you don't need to to understand the, what it does but my point is i mean how it works but you need to understand what it does I parse the input, I generate XML, and then on top of XML, I apply XSL transformation, which generates extra elements in this XSL called errors. So I put extra elements into XML, which are errors, 
and then I run again something on top of that which finds those errors inside XML and raise an exception for, for the user. So basically my uh, here I think the approach is interesting because uh, like I said I'm not dealing with uh, so much of a Java code so much of a Java structures but XML which is much more suitable for for this purpose much more suitable for representing uh, difficult to structure data if you present this data in Java if you design objects which in most cases will be very simple stupid uh, DTOs so data transfer objects they will be just dummy objects with no methods they will just store the data if you try to represent the whole abstract syntax tree the whole uh, syntax of EOLang in Java then you will have a huge collection of different objects which all need to be uh predefined with their structures and uh, you will need to have types and they 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 will have uh, many many public attributes in most cases or you will need to have getters and setters so it's going to be ugly total mess and when you want to change something for example you change the syntax of eolang and then you want to change uh, automatically you will have to change the structure of these uh, java classes it's going to be total mess but xml is a much more suitable um uh, format for storing the data which you don't understand uh, completely when you design it. When I started to design this EOLang, I didn't know exactly what the syntax will be about. I didn't know how to transfer it to, to, to the next steps. I didn't know how to catch errors. So all of this stuff, all of these transformations, look, this is XSL transformation. They're all different. And they were designed on top of, um, of, of, the, of the XML data structure. And everything was changing on the fly. And I still can change it. I can do it only because I use XML because it's very flexible uh, data structure for very flexible format for storing the and at the same time very formal so it's not just the text it's not just uh, unformatted unformatted piece of, uh, of of letters this is actually a very well structured format uh, so what else I wanted to show you Maybe it's time to wrap it up and then you ask me questions. Uh, yeah, maybe it's time for you to ask me if you have questions, then uh, tell me what you think about this and uh, and then I will answer. Let me answer first one. The question is, am I planning to make standard library and IDE for EOLang? Uh, I don't think we need to make IDE, but we definitely want to create a plugin for IntelliJ. A plugin which will highlight the syntax, which will make it possible to write an EOLang, for example, like here. It would be nice to would be nice to have syntax highlight. The syntax is very simple, so it would be nice to highlight. It would be nice to suggest methods. For example, here I say uh, that's the same as this. So I'm saying n less than than two. So it would be nice if I say if I hit the dot and then it 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 um, it uh, makes the auto completion of the code suggest me the method name. It's not the method actually in in EOLang. We don't have methods. We don't have attributes. We have only objects. So n is an object and less is an object. So it's like objects inside object inside object and so on. So we are definitely interested. If you want to contribute, if you want to create such a plugin for IntelliJ, then um, shoot me a line in Telegram and we can discuss. Uh, and then we can discuss how we can do it. Uh, any more questions? Did I tell you something interesting about Antler today? That's my, that's my question to you. Because I think there is a pretty standard way to use Antler, but I'm not sure that many people actually use Antler the way I just demonstrated you. When you parse the, the input, then you create XML, using this listener and then after that you use xml for all other manipulations and for understanding what was there in the parser because in a traditional way people use it like they parse then they generate java classes java objects a huge collection of them like a total mess of the java objects and then after that they start dealing with these java objects trying to to manipulate them and that is uh, a bad idea like I said, because you will need many of them. The more complex is your syntax, the more complex is the input, the more uh, Java objects you're gonna need, and uh, they will look uh, not very, uh, not very flex, uh, not very. Let's put it this way: not flexible. 
So it will be difficult for you to manipulate them, difficult to uh, refactor, to change your syntax, your input, uh, and to um, you will be very much stuck in the st in the Java structure structure you have. But I'm not stuck at all. I have like complete freedom. I can change the syntax anytime. I can uh, I can easily introduce more uh, more more data, more constructs for uh, for the XML. And there's a question. I think all these tools like are not good ex are not good because they generate Java code, for example. Uh, I think yeah. I think in most cases people are they they get scared by these tools because uh, uh, because they uh, because they generate. Oh, that's the question. A different. I, I I missed the point. So you're saying that these tools are not good because they generate Java code. I mean they generate they auto generate. Yeah, uh, files like here, like in the this one, generated sources. Yeah, so they generate they generate the parser, the lexer. I don't think there's any other way to. Yeah, they they generate pretty much a lot of code, very complex and uh, hard to not only understand but to do anything with it. It's auto generated code for Eolang. Uh, I think this is how all tools like this work. For all languages they just understand your grammar and then according to this grammar they create the parser for your destination language for java c plus plus whatever for python and then you compile that stuff for your platform and then you get the parser so you actually technically can write the parser yourself but it's routine job which will be over and over again and again i think this tool was created to um, to optimize this work for us and to make it easier and to and to get rid of uh, regular expressions which otherwise you have to use when you want to uh, parse the inputs in a, in a complex way all right so i think that's it uh, yeah human cannot read this code it's a very good comment so we are not supposed to read that code we're supposed to auto generate it so thanks for coming i hope i shared some good story for you maybe you learn about learn something from it and you i'm trying to actually convince you that xml is a good language for uh for data representation when you deal with complex data structures i'm trying to convince you to encourage you to get away from dummy java objects even though they're now promoted you know there's the uh, value classes or value value objects uh, show up in java I don't think it's a good idea to have them. When you need to store data, find the right format for data storage. And XML is the data storage format, just like SQL, just like relational or NoSQL databases. These are the places where you store the data. You don't store data in Java data structures, in memory. That's a, in most cases, it's the wrong idea. Data has to have their own format for storage, and XML is a perfect format. Maybe not XML, maybe JSON, but I do prefer XML because it's much more formal than JSON. JSON is for um, very small pieces of data which you want to transfer over the network. But XML is for something that you deal on the one machine when you need to, to deal with data in a more extensive way, then always uh, suggest I suggest to use XML, not JSON. Uh, Yeah, SQL is the language, not a store format. I mean relational databases. When I say SQL, when I say store data in SQL, I'm saying that uh, store them in relational in relational databases. So you you talk to the data in SQL language. You talk to the data in this XAML language. You talk to the data in XML in XML language, in JSON language, whatever. But there is a special language for data. Java is not the language for data. When people create complex structures of objects many objects encapsulate each other they 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 build complex object structures that's a wrong uh, they misunderstand uh, java they misunderstand the object oriented programming and this is a very good for me was a very good example i just i just didn't know how to do it i i understood that we have to parse they give us some uh, they give us some not even the data they they give us method calls to this listener so there's a listener and they call the listener and then my job is to do something with this uh, data injections so where do i put them the first the first uh, thought was to use 
Java object. But then I realized that XML is the answer. And here you go. We have a very interesting right now mechanism of dealing with the result with the data as a result. All right. That's it. Thanks for listening. I see you next time. We're trying to do it every month, every first Wednesday of the month. This webinar is about object oriented programming. Come in, join. Don't forget to buy my book. A little bit of promotion here Elegant Objects. Uh, Google it, find it on Amazon. Elegant Objects is the book which may help you understand object oriented programming better, Java specifically, but other languages as well. Uh, come back to the webinar. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter join my telegram channel and so on and so forth bye bye thank you very much